Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Western A. Price Nourishing Traditional Diets and Food as Medicine webinar with Saul Chamberlain, who's here beside me, and myself, um, Brenda Rogers. And I'll firstly introduce myself, uh, then I'm going to introduce Sula, then we're going to give you a little bit of information about the fundamentals that we're um, operating from. And then Sula is going to do some beautiful demonstration teaching you how to um, uh, do bone broths and casseroles, which is going to be uh, exciting. So first of all, my name is Brenda Rogers. I am a health coach, naturopath, and have been a nutritionist for 30 years. And I learned nutrition... Oh, well, 30 years ago and did the full, full course and never got introduced to the Western Price um, principles, which I was really amazed about. And then even did an, uh, an upgrade and an advanced uh, diploma of nutrition in 2013, 14, 15, and still didn't learn anything about them. You know, so that's, that tells you. And what, what, I, what I believe is that what we were really just taught whatever was the latest fad. I mean, it was maybe, maybe a great book had come out and it was thought, this is the latest. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, a few years ago, I was working at Billabong Retreat in Western Sydney. And the lady there who owned it, Tori, introduced me to the idea of the Western Price Foundation. And I just fell in love with it. When I really stopped and looked at it, I thought this makes sense. It was science and tradition, science and consciousness, science and common sense and results. The results were there for, uh, you know, well, it was really in Western Price's research, I think. So I, uh, I specialise in women's health, particularly women in their 40s, perimenopause, menopause, that's my main thing. And a lot of those women are struggling with weight and trying to do diets and the diets aren't working. And so I've realised now why that is. We're very carb heavy, which makes us very sugar craving and weight around the middle and, you know, so as I'm learning this stuff from these lovely people that are associating with the Western Price Foundation, my diet, my family's diet is transforming a little bit by a little bit. It takes a little while. And um, it's very exciting to see the difference that it makes to my skin, to my hair, to my appetite. I just eat way less. I feel nourished and I've got tons of energy and so on. So, uh, so it's my very great pleasure now to be working with Sula for this event and just to give you an introduction to some of you know Sula some of you don't Sula is the creator and director of the Whole Foods brand Star Anise Organic Whole Foods she's very prolific on Instagram if you want to check that out she's a dedicated uh, owner of the first dedicated broth bar called the Bronte Broth Bar and Lard here in Bronte uh, which is amazing I went there for lunch for dinner and had uh, chicken noodle soup with rice noodles. Um, it was delicious. She's a devoted mother of two, a cooking instructor specialising in real and traditional foods. She's a health coach, a public speaker, a wellness blogger, author of a school lunchbox inspiration ebook. Because all those struggling mums out there trying mm. to find things for their kids. And of course, uh, loves the sun and surf, as otherwise you wouldn't live here, right? Um, and on a serious mis mission like myself and the team who I'm about to introduce to you as well to bring nutrient-dense traditional whole foods back to the, the modern family kitchen and table to empower people to lead less toxic and more nourishing lives. And just before I hand over to Sula for her, uh, for her story and her introduction to finish off all the other stuff that I've missed, um, I'd just like to introduce you to our helpers tonight, our team, and that's Avril Haysha, also Sandra Santoro and Larissa Wright and Elise Marsep. And all these ladies will perhaps be answering your questions in the chat or suggestions, or um, some of them will be summarizing key points. So look out for them and thank them um, as well. 
So over to you, Sula, tell us your story. Yeah, How did you, you come across Brenda. all of this? Well, in my previous life, I was a corporate lawyer for 10 years, eating a conventional diet that I grew up on, the sad diet, and engaging in lifestyle factors that were less than optimal, but considered normal in today's society. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I was about 26, I had a big breakdown, ended up in hospital, out of action for two months. And that was a big wake up call for me. Um, I started making some positive lifestyle changes, but one thing I did do was I became a very hardcore macrobiotic vegetarian at sometimes vegan because I thought it was healthy. Yeah. The government very much steers us towards a, a low fat, high grain diet. So I thought I was being super healthy. Um, and then my second big wake up call happened when my baby boy ended up in hospital at 11 months. And we were also raising him as a vegetarian, thinking we were being super healthy. And there's nothing like seeing your baby boy in hospital as a mother that makes you stop dead in your tracks and start to question that dietary approach and actually really question everything we were putting in and on our bodies and not putting in and out on our bodies. And I came across the works of Western A. Price through my gorgeous naturopath. And that was a couple of years earlier. And I really sort of like resisted and resisted and resisted it because, oh because I thought it was really unethical uh, and unsustainable to eat animals. And it wasn't until later on down the track when I read uh, Leah Keats, The Vegetarian Myth, and listened to a lot of podcasts by Joss Latin that I really now appreciate the ignorance of that approach. Right. Um, but the real turning point for me was when my naturopath dragged me to see Sally Fallon when she came to Australia in 2007. And I was nine weeks pregnant with my second baby. And I kind of rocked up thinking, oh, you know, what's all this gonna be about? And I spent an entire day, it was like a seven hour talk, and she combined the ancestral diet with the science. Yeah. And when the two combined and interlocked, to me, that was a real turn on for me. And that was a real turning point for me. Um, and I remember driving straight out thinking, well, I'm not going to make the same mistake I did with my first board. And I went straight to a butcher <laughs> and I came home and said to my partner at the time, right, we're going to start eating meat. You can eat what you want, but me and my son and my future baby, this is what we're doing. Yeah. And he ended up coming on board a little bit later on. Um, and we went from barely surviving to thriving, all just from changing our diet. And that's when it really yeah. hit home to me, the power of food as medicine. Mm. Um, and you gotta understand that I never set out to start a business. I just started cooking and eating nutrient dense traditional whole foods, things like pine broth, slow cooks, um, organ meats, you know, chicken with a pate, because back then in Sydney, you know, 13 years ago, no one was making and selling it. So desperation breeds creativity. I got back into the kitchen. I started with Sally Fallon's cookbook. It was all in pounds and ounces, and I kind of really yeah. simplified the recipes and yeah. um, created my own original recipes. Um, and it was really persistent friends who insisted on buying my food and then through word of mouth the circle kept expanding and friends of friends came knocking at the door and the circle just kept expanding and expanding until one mother's helper ended up turning into 16 oh, wow. over the years and then I had no choice but to open up a little retail store which as Brenda said is called Broth Bar and Light up the street from my home um, and then quite early on in that process I was approached by a group of women who said what's so special about this food can you teach us how to make it and that's how the cooking classes started because I really felt it was my honor and privilege and duty to empower women with the skills on how to make this traditional whole food, this nourishing food in their home. And then the one-on-one -on -one health coaching started because even though I'm completely self-taught and don't have any qualifications in nutrition, people could see that I was a voracious researcher and did my due diligence, due diligence very thoroughly, thanks to my days as a corporate lawyer. And so I'd be asked a million questions a day on nutrition and where to buy things from and how to cook it and macronutrient ratio. So that's where I sit down with people and cover what I call the fundamentals of robust nutrition in one-on-one -on -one health coaching and more recently do group now. Uh, food as medicine talks around Australia and now virtually with a holistic dietitian. Um, so that's really been my story and it's been just a tremendous journey of self-empowerment and understanding what really makes us tick and thrive. Um, and bringing, you know, I've just found myself catapult on this mission, of, as you said, of bringing nutrient distribution whole foods back to the modern table. Yeah.
gosh, I think we need it though. There's a bit of a epidemic of poor health out there. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, um, people just so confused with what to eat. So we've got a few slides to, to start off with and then we'll take away that and we'll just have uh, Sula showing you all this stuff that she's got prepared for you. But first of all, we wanted to do our due diligence and ensure that you recognise that this is educational only, not diagnostic. Mm. Um, we like to encourage you to take full responsibility for your health. I think, you know, you are your own best doctor. You are your own best expert. And so that is important, but also it's important in that sense to know when it's time to go and get help. So please uh, keep in mind, I think, see a naturopath first. <laughs> or some other see holistic doctor. functional medicine practitioner. Functional medicine. And if you don't know who to go to, please reach out because I have a team that supports me that are on exactly the same nutritional page. So your practitioners speak your language. So we... Mm -hmm. I forgot that one, sorry. It's all right, that's me. That's where you can we'll find have another me. one at the end it's so where you, can you can see those details. Take, a, take a camera. <laughs> <laughs> Take a photo. Um, so, yeah, people are really confused. I mean, I remember studying this stuff, yeah. juicing and food combining, yeah. blood types. I think I tried every single one of yeah. these things, just went through yeah. them all. So much confusion out there. And who can blame people? There's a lot of different vested interests. There are, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though uh, the Western Price Foundation the, you know, we're talking about traditional diets, which varies really a lot. If you think about the Eskimos who, who ate largely animal versus, which, you know, it's really cold up mm. there, versus the Indian nations that are largely vegetarian, there's a quite a breadth there of, um, of options, really. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'll be covering some of those mm -hmm. things today, won't we? Just for, yeah. yeah, so even though traditional societies ate different foods, depending on climate and geographic region, we'll explain to you that their diets always shared a basic template, yeah, right. you know, yeah. and no traditional society was vegetarian or chose no. to be vegetarian. Not completely anyway. So we all kind of started out with the, um, <laughs> following the traditional, the conventional food pyramid, um, because we think that the government's got our best interest at heart. Um, and it was a sad day for me when I realized, well, maybe, they don't really know that much about nutrition. Maybe they're just um, being funded by some vested interests. Uh, so we need to do our own research and tune in with our own body and just check in, you know, how has uh, a conventional diet worked out for you? I know how it worked out for me. And you can see this is a great slide that the shape of his body very much mirrors. It's what happens when you become carp heavy and the bulk of your diet are refined ingredients, particularly refined starches. And they're cheap. Yeah. It's commod that commodity is just, it's yeah. food for the masses. Just pump it out there. Yeah. Yeah. I certainly was pretty well addicted to carbs for a long time. That uh, wasn't a great thing. So tell us about Weston Price. You said yeah. his name a few times. Who is he? What did yeah. yeah. What, what, why is he so important? Yeah. So he's the father of modern medicine and really every medic, medical school, school and uh, course on nutrition really should have his work centre stage. And we're not going to see a change, I believe, in the epidemic of chronic illness and degenerative disease until that happens at that institutional level. But until then, we have to do the work now here at the grassroots level, which is why I do the work I do at the grassroots level. So Westnay Price was a dentist, a scientist. And in the earlier part of last century, in the 1920s, he was becoming increasingly concerned with a growing number of cavities in people's teeth and the crowding of the mouth and the narrowing of the face. And he thought, this is really weird. The human mouth should be well formed. What's going on here? I wonder if diet uh, has anything to do with this. So he and his wife took a decade off and went and lived with and studied 14 different traditional societies all around the world in different continents. And he wanted to know if they had perfect teeth. And if so, because teeth are a reflection of your health, he wanted to know, well, what were they eating? And he specifically chose traditional societies that were eating the food that their ancestors had been eating for millennia and living a lifestyle that was in accordance with how their ancestors had lived for millennia, sort of untouched by industrialization. And so... Uh, he uh, 
first went to countries like Switzerland, where this little particular village, this, this valley was completely self-sufficient. They had to, because of the way where they were located, grow all their own food and everything was self-sustaining. The only thing they got in through one little dirt track was salt, salt yeah. and everything else was, uh, se that was self-sustaining. So it was all that, you know, very traditional, well, you know, farm raised food. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he found when he studied them that um, every single person in a traditional society, not just the lucky few like today, but every single person in traditional society had perfect, robust health, not a single cavity. This is in the days well before toothpaste and toothbrushes. They had beautiful physical form, you know, what we would call supermodels. They were all tall and muscular and slender. No one was underweight or overweight. They all had, you know, happy dispositions and gave birth to uh, robust, healthy, vibrant babies who grew up into happy, healthy, well-adjusted um, adults. And you can see you know, in this photo here on the right, they're all barefoot, um, walking in like, you know, icy streams. And, you know, Western Price was like, oh, my God, you know, this water, how can they, um, you know, not feel the cold? But because their constitution was so strong and they were so robust and they had such a strong immune system, um, you know, they were able to withstand these um, feelings of cold, a bit like, you know, the Wim Hof <laughs> method yeah. nowadays. They, they were living it and breathing it. Uh, so you can see that they had, you know, beautiful teeth. Um, lovely, clear skin, beautiful faces. And I also find that when they, when you eat enough saturated fat, which is heat generating, that you don't, you know how so many people are freezing all the time? Yeah. It's a cold all the time. That can be a nutritional thing. Don't you find? Well, your body then starts self-regulating. So the more you minimise what I call the mismatch between our genes, our biology and our lifestyle factors, the more the body can just reach what we call homeostasis. Uh, in all its form and functions and structure. And the greatest yearning of the human body is that it's homeostasis. Mm. It's constantly mm. fighting, you know, fighting to, and moving molecules to get back into homeostasis. Mm. Um, so then the beauty of Western A. Price's work is that he was able to compare these traditional societies to neighbouring industrialised, modernised um, towns where they had started embracing industrialized food like white refined flour, white refined sugar, vegetable oils. And he found that the contrast showed that they were experiencing a narrowing of the face, um, you know, cavities, uh, narrowing of the dental arch, what we call now signs of or what he called mental and physical degeneration and hence the title of his, his tomb, his work, um, nutrition and, and mental degeneration, physical degeneration. And he had a term for that, those foods that came in, the foods of modern... Convenience. Modern convenience. Yeah, because they're quick, fast, easy. <laughs> yeah, they come at a cost and we're paying with our health. Uh, went to Ireland, the Gaelic people, you can see, you know, happy dispositions, the Alaskan people, look how broad their faces are, um, high cheekbones, robust, healthy children. <laughs> Put a bit of mood on. <laughs> um, so they lived in a state free of tooth decay and degenerative diseases. So there was, you know, no chronic illness and degenerative disease at all in these societies. So... Um, broad dental arches. Compare once again the modernised Alaskans. You start seeing the first generation suffering from tooth decay, and then of course um, they're going to uh, pass that on to the next generation, and so on and so forth. So the modernised Alaskans, the second generation, had an even more narrow face and suffered from more dental crowding. Um, so lots of. The teeth going irregular, in, yeah. irregular teeth. Yeah, yeah. We just think that's all normal today, but you know, it might be normal because everyone's got it. But it's not natural. The human mouth is supposed to be well formed. He even came to Australia, studied um, the indigenous inhabitants of Australia, the Aboriginals. Look at the the dental arch here, like it is textbook perfect. Mm. Look at that brilliant horseshoe. Um, as I said, well before toothpaste, toothbrushes, you know, no braces here. <laughs> and then, of course, we can uh, contrast to decay in uh, first generation where industrialised foods are coming into play. This is how uh, powerful food can be and how it um, can, what we call, switch on our genes for better or for worse. 
actually altering the shape of our face. So the next generations will have an overbite, an underbite, a sunken mid third section of the face, not as high cheekbones, a lot, um, narrow, lot narrower, um, you know, not, a, not as happy and vibrant. You know, the body's saying something's not quite right here. I'm lacking in those nutrients, particularly vitamin A, D, E, and K2. And they call vitamin A the constant master of fetal development because that's what's responsible for giving. Say that again. So vitamin A is what we call the constant master of fetal development. Because constant master, like the conductor. The, the, the conductor. It is the, 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 the primary vitamin because it's responsible for giving babies that beautiful broad face broad dental arch, high cheekbones, and vitamin A is found in things like organ meats. Mm. And that's the very thing that most yeah. people uh, are, are not yeah. eating, you know, all yeah. our beautiful pastured animal products. It's the very thing that, that, you know, doctors say, only oh, keep away from the pate and the organ meats. And that's the very thing they should be eating. Mm. Um, so this was just a quick summary. So you can see that it's not just the teeth we're talking about here, but the whole body. So on the left hand side, you can see with straight teeth, there's plenty of room in the head for everything, including the nasal passages. So some of that sinus epidemic that we have is just from, because there's just no, mm. not enough space there anymore. Um, good skeletal development and good muscles. Eyesight's great, hearing's great, all the organs are great. People are positive and optimistic, mm. and then women are able to give birth yeah. easily. So you can see that having straight teeth isn't, you know, and having a beautiful broad face and high cheekbones and broad dental arch isn't just aesthetic. It aids in the form and functioning of the body. We can then function optimally. Our children can function optimally. You know, and I saw this play out firsthand with my two kids, you know, my first born on a vegetarian diet and then my second baby who uh, I call my Western A. Price baby from nine weeks in utero. Uh, they've got the same genes but different brought up on different diets for the first couple of years of their life. Mm. And this really played out with them, the, the difference in their dental arch, um, their, uh, you know, even just their, their mood, you know, their sinuses, they're just, yeah, the contrast was so stunning. And that's what really behooved me to share my story with the world. Mm. And then here are some photos of just some, um, what we call, you know, standard Australian and, you know, West Western children, American children, we think this is normal, but you can see just in contrast to the photos of the primitive um, traditional society, just how narrow our faces have become, you know, uh, and that sunken mid third section of the face. And, you know, this is, this is our normal, but it's, it's not natural. But the good news is, but wait, there's good news. <laughs> there is always good news is that we can reverse it in one generation. So simply by feeding our offspring, our, offspring, our, our children, the very nutrient rich traditional whole foods that we are biologically designed to eat, they can start functioning optimally. Uh, their form is impeccable. And they can they're basically yeah, grow and function properly, perform their best you know, and live their, their brightest, most vibrant life. And at the end of the day, that's what we want as parents. And that can just happens in one generation. So it's the parents that have to eat that way to be able to pass yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. Because what we pass on to our children at point of conception is not just our hard-coded genes, but the expression of our genes, which is driven purely by lifestyle factors. Mm -hmm. So this is why we've got to be so concerned with what we're eating and other lifestyle factors, because at the moment of conception, we are passing that on to the next generation, like a bank account. That's your investment. And then they then will pass that on to the next generation and so on and so forth. So if you've already got children. Well, great. well, no, not necessarily. So the earlier you get onto it, the better. The first, obviously, you know, if you can prepare uh, before you fall pregnant, that's the, ideal. The, the ideal. And traditional societies would, you know, three years, nine months have child spacing in between pregnancies because that's how long it takes to rebuild the mother's nutrient stores. That's how seriously they took it. So, you know, even if you can do six months of eating a Western Price diet before conception, that's great. You know, nowadays people fall pregnant, you know, without even thinking about that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is such a beautiful gift you can give to your offspring is the best chance to start their life, you know, is the healthiest one. Um, the, the human body is extremely malleable in the first seven years. So you can get them onto a traditional whole foods diet in the first seven years. So I noticed, you know, when my son started a traditional whole foods diet when he was 22 months so nearly two years his immune system is now on par with his sister um you know his facial structure 
in dental arch, you know, not, not so much. Um, but, you know, in terms of um, his immunity and how, you know, other things like that, they're on a par. Then the next seven years is less malleable and the next seven years is less malleable. You know, but even as adults, you know, we can still make profound changes, you know, to our health. And, and you know, I've got first-hand experience of this. You know, I suffered all sorts of things, osteoskeletal issues, constipation, lost my period, cystic acne, legally blind, big shopping list of stuff. Are and you breaking um, bones or something? Yeah, I kept breaking bones on a vegetarian diet, so many osteoskeletal issues. You know, and that's all reversed and stopped just through, you know, simply eating a nutrient-dense traditional diet. I think I actually grew an inch because I was always five foot six and only in the past 10 years, now it's always five foot seven. And it's like, well, that's what's wow. changed my diet. And my foot size, my shoe size went up a size. So you can see, you can still make these, what we call epigenetic changes, even as adults. But of course, as children, they're more pronounced. Yeah, yeah. Of Just one question. Hmm. Because if, you're, if you have an Indian background or Asian, they are more towards the vegetarian. But you're saying that no traditional culture was ever vegetarian. It depends so what... on how far back you go. When people say that, they're only looking in the past 10,000 years, like, you know, really. So, I mean, our genes were set on a hunter-gatherer diet 2.6 million years ago. So, really, depends on how far back you want to go. Our genes were set 2.6 million years ago, haven't changed much since. So, we really should be eating a diet that was congruent with what our hunter-gatherer ancestors were eating back then which was essentially a paleolithic diet. Um, and it wasn't until the advent of agriculture that grains and legumes came into play. But that doesn't mean we, don't, we shouldn't eat them. It just means that they need to be properly prepared in a certain way to make them more nutrient dense and minimize the anti-nutrients. But I don't think grains and legumes should be the bulk of our diet. Yeah, and I believe that even in those um, vegetarian cultures, they would eat sort of insects or spiders or... Um, yeah, that's that's true. They were never purely a hundred percent vegetarian okay. or, or chose to be. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, next is our Yes. There, there so, are there are ten ten principles to the Weston A. Price Foundation um, philosophy. And we're really just looking at one today, which yeah. is the all traditional cultures made the use of bones. They all so, made good use of the bones of the animals and um, they would gnaw on the bone, suck the marrow from the bone, make bone broth. And I guess they realised through trial and error over millennia the numerous health benefits of making good use of the bones of the animal. So the three main benefits of bone broth are collagen, gelatin and glycine. So collagen, that's the primary structural element that you know holds, it's like the glue that holds the bodies of animals and humans together. That's all gonna be released when you make a bone broth. So collagen is really important for building, repairing and maintaining our osteoskeletal system. So uh, joints, ligaments, cartilage, tendons, muscles. So for me, that's where bone broth had the most impact. It wasn't until I started consuming one cup of bone broth a day that all my osteoskeletal issues vanished. Like I stopped breaking bones. I didn't have tight ropey muscles anymore. Didn't need to go to my osteopath twice a week. I wasn't click clacking when I was walking up and down the stairs. I was pain free, you know. Wow. And I thought being in pain was just normal. Um, and collagen is also found, it's the primary structural element of our hair, skin and nails. So that if, if collagen is what gives skin that youthful glow, suppleness and elasticity. Uh, so that's why I coined the phrase a good 10 years ago, bone broth is my Botox, because everyone kept asking me, your skin is always glowing, you know, what, what, you know, what are you using? Um, so that's collagen. And then you cook collagen and cooking it down breaks it down into gelatin. And gelatin is what gives bone broth it's wibbly wobbly factor and the more wibbly wobbly the more gelatinous and the more gut healing and sealing so gelatin is all about digestion and gut healing and sealing it provides a beautiful mucosal lining healthy mucosal lining on the gut wall to keep the tight junctions the tj's nice and tight like a uh, nice and tight like this rather than leaky like a sieve uh, and then one of the main amino acids, which is the building block of protein that's found in gelatin is glycine. Glycine does some really important things. Um, first of all, it's what we call a balancer. It balances out, out our muscle meat intake. And what people don't, many people don't appreciate is that when we eat muscle meat, 
because it's high in something called methionine. Methionine can only fulfill its essential functions in the presence of glycine. So we should be teaming muscle meat with glycine rich foods like bone broth. So that's why my dinner mantra or formula is meat three veg plus broth. And they all come together in a soup or a casserole. But yeah, whatever yeah. concoction we're having, yeah. it's always meat, three veg plus broth. So glycine is a, a balancer. Glycine also helps the body to detoxify. If you consider the, you know, the uh, general state of you know, increased toxicity of our modern day world, it's really important that we avail ourselves of detoxifying foods like bone broth to assist the liver in its near constant detoxification task. And lastly, bone uh, glycine. In bone broth, it's really important to provide feelings of emotional stability, mental calmness, and sound sleep. So you can get all that those feelings from bone broth. You don't need to take a pill for it. Yeah, uh, and of course, bone broth does contain some micronutrients as well, and it makes everything just so much more flavoursome. And studies have shown that it's very immune building and fortifying. There's some great uh, traditional sayings like, you know, a good bone broth brings back the dead. And the Jewish call it Jewish penicillin. So there's scientific yeah, studies yeah. That, that back that up. Our grandmothers really did know, know best, didn't there's they? There's so much wisdom in ancestral diets that we just flippantly disregard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to stop sharing the screen now. And Sula, you're going to show us... How to make a bone broth. How to make a bone broth. Yeah. So I'm going to yeah. just adjust the camera so we can see you properly with what you're doing. There with yeah. the ladies. So while Brenda's doing that, I'll just point out that the recipe and the step-by-step -step how to and all the nutritional theory that I'll be discussing tonight about bone broth can be found in my online bone broth workshop on my website. And all you lovely people will get a beautiful discount to that just by being part of this talk tonight. So the online workshop comes, it's a lifelong access. It comes with both a video and a booklet. Uh, and it covers, as I said, nutritional theory, as well as all the how-to and the recipes. You get lots of recipes in here as well. In, as well. So, um, so I'm gonna show you tonight how to make a beef broth, because maybe some of you uh, haven't made beef broth before. I know chicken broth tends to be um, more popular. It's a little bit more palatable, but beef broth is more gelatinous. So if I show you the finished products, just bear with me, I have a beef and a chicken. Um, so here you can see a chicken broth, it's lighter in color. Beef broth is a lot darker in color. Chicken broth, you know, this is still quite gelatinous. Uh, the beef broth is even more gelatinous. It's got that more jelly-like feel. So if you've got gut issues, um, like leaky gut or autoimmunity, um, I would say you'd need to be uh, smashing the beef broth. But of course, you know, you can alternate so you don't get taste fatigue. Okay. So to make a broth, I don't know if you can see my pot here. So first of all, you're going to get a stainless steel pot. Make sure there's no aluminium in it because aluminium is a neurotoxin. So we want stainless steel. And just get the biggest one that you can comfortably lift. So 20 litre pot is going to be 20 kilos. That's quite heavy for most females. I've got here a 10 litre one. So that's going to be when it's full, it's going to be 10 kilos. Most women can comfortably pick up 10 kilos. And I think if you don't know where to start, maybe start with 10 a 10 litre pot. And if you find you're getting through the broth really, really quickly and you're making it you know, a bit too frequently than what you'd like, you can then upgrade to a 20 litre one. Okay, once you've got your pot, the ingredients are really simple, incredibly simple. So you've got um, bones. <laughs> okay, so you've got bones and these are obviously beef bones. Um, this is the joint. The joint is going to give um, it's got a lot of cartilage, a lot of um, collagen, which will break down and make it more gelatinous. And then you can see this is the marrow in here. So this is kind of like the shank. You don't want to make a broth just with the shank, just with the marrow bones, because it's not going to be as gelatinous, even though it will most certainly be very nutritious. So you want the joint and the marrow kind of together or combination of them. So that's the main ingredient. So we're going to put those into... Um, our pot. Now, not all bones are created equal. So just like all food, we have to really give a lot of um, weight and importance 
to the provenance, the source of the bones. So when it comes to ruminant animals, animals with a rumen like cow and bee, uh, lamb, they're designed to eat one thing and one thing and only, and that is grass. So we want to ask for grass fed and finished bones from lambs or uh, cow. Finished means they're finished on grass all the way right to the point of abattoir. They're not finished on grains. Grains make cows and lamb fat. They also make them sick because it's not their traditional diet. Uh, that incongruence uh, will make them sick, okay? And then us. So, and then us. And then us, so we eat that sick meat, but you know, so there's a chain reaction here, it loops back to us. So we wanna ask for a grass-fed and finished bones or another way of saying that is 100% grass-fed. Is certified get, uh, organic necessary? No, if it's grass fed and finished or 100% you know, grass fed and they're free of antibiotics and hormones, doesn't need to be certified organic. And in fact, I think it's gonna be virtually impossible uh, to find certified organic bones. So, you know, if they're grass fed and finished, uh, free of antibiotics and hormones, you, that's, that's what you want. In terms of chickens, um, and if you're do, doing a pork broth, chickens and pigs are a little bit different to the ruminant animals. They're designed to eat not just grass, but they'll forage on um, seeds and uh, worms and veggie scraps and things like that. So the terminology is pastured. You're going to ask your butcher for pastured chicken bones or pig bones. Um, chicken bones are called frames, so the terminology is a bit different. So chicken frames or chicken carcasses as opposed to beef bones, it's just terminology. Um, so pastured means they're roaming around on pasture in sunshine, eating what they're biologically designed to eat. The advantage of going certified organic for the chicken though, is that the grains they most definitely will be feeding chicken. Uh, you can be assured if they're certified organic, they're not gonna be genetically modified. Okay, so that's why with the beef, you don't need to go certified organic if they're grass-fed and finished and free of antibiotics and hormones, but with chicken, uh, I would, you know, go certified organic or if you can't get certified organic, you'd have to ask uh, the chicken, um, you know, the butcher or the chicken farmer a little bit about what grains are you feeding them? Do they contain corn and soy? They're genetic, uh, you know, they're typically genetically modified. Okay, so you've got your pot and you put your bones in there. Basically, the rule is fit as many bones as you can into your pot, okay? You're going to leave it, you know, a little bit of wiggle room, but basically just try and fit as much as you can. And as a general rule, it's going to be about the half the size of the pot in terms of kilos. So if you've got a 10-litre pot, you're going to put about five kilos or a little bit less of bones in. You've got a 20-litre pot, you're going to put about 10 kilos or a little bit less of bones in, okay? Then the next ingredient is filtered water. So I'm just going to put in my filtered water. Where possible, we want to use filtered water, not tap water. Tap water contains chlor chlorine, fluoride, heavy metals. They're toxic to the human body. Uh, so we want to get a water filter, like a reverse osmosis water filter, which is the highest level of water filtration that takes everything out and reconstructs H2O. If you don't have a water filter, uh, it's a really great investment in your health. Uh, there's no point eating an amazing diet if you're just going to be drinking tap water. Can you fill those up again, Brenda, with sure. uh, filtered water? Uh, you can, if you don't have a water filter, call the water shop in Camaray. Ask them for a reverse osmosis water filter. Tell them I referred you and you'll get a 20% discount. You have it with you for life and you take it with you from house to house. It doesn't matter if you're owning or renting. This is like the fourth house I've taken mine to. And you're going to fill it up with just enough water that almost, but not quite, covers the bones. Okay, you don't want it to complete the water to completely cover the bones. You want it to almost but not quite cover the bones. Otherwise, your broth isn't going to be as gelatinous as it is otherwise would be if you drown the bones by completely covering them. So yeah, a little bit more. Um, so in my workshop booklet, I set out uh, five reasons why your broth may not be gelatinous. There's a whole section here on frequently asked questions. So if you've got a question, I guarantee it's going to be uh, one of the frequently asked questions in here. Um, one of them is, why is my broth not gelatinous? There's five reasons. One of the reasons is you've added too much water. Okay. So I think this is, I don't know if you can see, a good amount of water. I've left some wiggle room. Okay, so I haven't filled it. I've left a good couple of inches because when it comes to the boil, I don't, I want, to, don't want it to be like overflowing uh, and making a big mess over my stove and potentially causing a fire. Okay, all right. So um, I've put enough bones in there, almost covered it with filtered water. The next thing we want to add in, and this is optional, the next ingredient 
um, are herbs and spices. You don't need to add herbs and spices. You can if you want. So I'm going to add in some peppercorns, okay? Um, some teaspoon? Yeah, one teaspoon of peppercorns um, uh, or half a teaspoon, depending. Um, for a 10 litre pot, couple of teaspoons of thyme. Um, I'm adding in a few bay leaves. You can add in some garlic granules if you like. Uh, and that's pretty much a broth by what we do. It's just salt, uh, not salt. Salt will come later on. I'm going to segue into that down the track. Ignore the salt for the minute. We, we don't add salt at this point. We add it at the end when we strain it. So it's in a perfect ratio to get perfect taste. So at this point, we are only adding a broth by. We just add pepper, bay leaves and thyme. We used to add garlic granules, but we took them out because a lot of people are allergic to it. Um, then, Sorry, can I just yep. interrupt you? There's a question in the chat asking, is there a difference if you roast the bones first? Only in terms of flavour, but if you are slow cooking this for a good 12 to 18 hours, that difference in flavour is going to be so marginal, it's not going to be worth your time, effort, energy and electricity bills. So the reason where roasting would become relevant if you're doing a really short broth, only like two or three hours, like in restaurants, and you have to then roast the bones in order to get flavour, otherwise it's not going to be as flavoursome. We're doing this baby overnight or for a good, you know, minimum of eight, maximum of say, you know, 15 to 24 hours, trust me, it's going to be flavoursome enough. The roasting of the bones ain't going to add enough flavour to warrant making a difference, okay? Thank you. And then the next uh, thing that we, you can add that a lot of people add are vegetables. Now, for about a decade, I added vegetables in um, to impart nutrients and flavour. And then once again, I realised that with the flavour, even on slow cooking it for that length of time, the vegetables actually weren't adding a hell of a lot of flavour. And secondly, we were always eating vegetables separately at the meal anyway, so we're getting nutrients there. And adding in organic veggies every time was getting quite expensive. So we just stopped doing the veggies. And also that has the advantage, because I'm selling it commercially, is that my broth is as least allergenic as possible. Um, and is, you know, um, there's always going to be someone that's allergic to some vegetable, uh, or kind of some vegetable. So that way I'm... I'm I'm providing the least allergenic broth on the market. Now, a question. Yeah. Lots of us have been told to put vinegar in. Yeah. Okay. So for a long time, about a decade, I used to add vinegar in. Then some scientific research came out that actually said that vinegar doesn't draw out minerals from the bone as it's purported to. Um, and also there was other evidence. There was a Chris Cresser podcast saying that um, it, the vinegar was setting off people, children that were on the spectrum. So we stopped the vinegar as well. So basically bones, water uh, and herbs, uh, and that's it, no vegetables. But having said that with the vegetables, if you're making a broth, open up your crisper jaw. And if there's some sad looking vegetables, you're otherwise gonna throw out like a sad looking carrot, celery leaves, sad soft, chuck it in, okay? Don't eat them uh, once they've you know, been simmering for that length of time, all the nutrients have come out of them. So you just discard them along with the bones. And yeah, and as uh, we discussed just now, as Brenda uh, asked, we don't add the vinegar either. So that's it, uh, incredibly simple. Then you put the lid on, you take it to your stove top, you um, turn the heat on high, bring it to a boil, which will take anywhere between half an hour to an hour. So make sure you're around because you don't want a big mess everywhere. And then you're going to turn it down really, really low until they're tiny, 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 tiny bubbles. And we're going to show you what that looks like. When I say tiny bubbles, I mean just like pop, pop, pop. Because if they're too vigorous, it's going to evaporate. And really when you open it up the next morning or you know, you know, anywhere between 10 to... 15, 18 hours later, there shouldn't be much, if any, reduction. If it's reduced too much, either the lid hasn't been put on properly or the temperature's too high. Okay, now if your um, gas stove top is too intense, you can get these things called simmer plates or simmer stackers where you just stack them underneath and it sort of lifts it up so that you'll find the sweet spot uh, where you'll know, you know, the exact how much to turn the knob and how much to stack them. Uh, yeah, so always with the lid on, bring it to the boil and then keep the lid on, slow simmer it, forget about it. Uh, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to strain a broth that I put on from yesterday. So I will bring that over. So I'm just going to uh, plonk it there. 
Okay, so this is a 20 litre pot. So, and I didn't fill it up just so it's easier for me to um, lift. So you can see here, can you see these tiny little bubbles? Can you see how it's just, so this is what it's been doing. Uh, yeah, for the past, and I haven't, I purposely didn't fill it up, but can you see how the bones are still poking out? I haven't drowned the bones. So I, I packed in as many bones as I, I wanted to, and I just poured enough water in so that some of the bones were still poking out. And see these tiny bubbles, so that's what it's been doing. 15, 20 hours. All right, so then I have it near your sink. Get a really, really big bowl like this, okay? Then you're going to, I line my bowl with some uh, biodegradable plastic bag because it's just easier to take all the bones to the bin that way. Okay, and the first thing you're going to do, and this is where if you wanted to wear an apron because it can get quite messy um, as the bones kind of sometimes drop and splash. You're going to just take out the big bones with, and you can ooh, see how they just kind of break and fall apart. And it does, they can splatter and splash. Okay, now in here, in that um, marrow uh, hole, you can see all the marrow coming out. Now, if you can, because marrow is so nutritious, if you can gently, you can be bothered to, to scoop it out. It's different to fat. When you touch it, it breaks apart really easily. If you wanted to reserve that, like get a little container and put it in and you can just add that into, um, you know, into a creamy soup. No one will even know it's in there. Uh, like heels, like, so that marrow is good for your own bone marrow. Uh, for the sake of tonight, I'm just going to discard everything just so we can move on. Um, and there's also a recipe in my bone broth workshop for uh, baby bone marrow custard. So I was thinking, what am I gonna do with all this wonderful bone marrow? So we make a, a beautiful custard with it with some other traditional fats like butter and cream, and you can add um, vanilla and raw cacao. Okay, so we take out all the bones and all the big chunky pieces. So assembling the broth only takes literally a few minutes, like single digit minutes. Um, it's the straining of the broth that takes a little bit more time Okay, so we've got all the big, got most of the big bones taken out. All right, so now what I'll do now the big bones are taken out, I'm just going to get a strainer and strain out all the smaller bones and all the cartilage and the loose bits of fat that are floating everywhere. Sometimes you'll get chunks of meat. And if you do, that makes for a really good broth because it's richer in colour and flavour. And whether or not you're going to get much meat really depends on your butcher and how closely the butcher is cutting to the bone. So if they're a really good butcher, they're going to cut really close to the bone. You're not going to get much, if any, meat. Um, I think butchers are becoming better and better over the years because I remember when I started making bone broth, you know, 13 years ago, I would have pyrexes and pyrexes full of all this meat that I would then add back into a soup when I was making it. Nowadays, the butchers are cutting the, the meat so close to the bone that all you're getting is lily white bones and no meat. Okay. All right, so I've taken the vast majority of all the herbs, spices, bones, all those out. Okay. All right, and then the next thing we do there's going to be this layer of fat that rises to the top of a beef broth called beef tallow. And that's a very traditional fat that your great grandmother would have cooked with um, because it's from a ruminant animal. It's you know very nourishing to eat. I tend to get rid of the chicken fat because they're not ruminant animals. It, chicken fat tends to be higher in omega-6, which is pro-inflammatory. So we tend to not eat the fat that rises to the top of the chicken broth, but not so with the beef broth. We want to save that beef tallow. So you've got a couple options here. You can um, scoop it off first or you can ignore it and just when you do fill your jars, you'll see the layer of fat rising to the top of the jars and then you can deal with it then. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to scoop it off and just put it into a container that I can then put in the freezer and then use that 
as a traditional fat to cook meat and other steak, you know, steak, meat, you know, things like that, lamb chops, sausages, um, because it comes from the very animal you're cooking and you'll save on butter costs. And it's quite a different colour to the beef broth. This is kind of yellowy gold. And you have a surprising amount of tallow. And then you can, lives in the freezer. So I'll just grab another container. Um, and if you want to be really fancy pants about it, what we do at Broth Bar is we ladle it off directly into silicon ice cube trays. Or we cool it first and then ladle it into ice cube trays. So that when it freezes, you've got these perfectly frozen cubes and we sell them as tallow cubes. And then you just melt down a tallow cube or however much of the cube you like, go straight from the freezer into the frying pan, cook your meat in it, um, or if you just want to put it into a container like this, you're just going to, you know, get a knife and hack off as much of, as you need. Okay, so I've ladled off most of the, bro the tallow. Tallow is also an excellent, and it's obviously free and cheap, it's coming with your broth, uh, body moisturiser. So it's, uh, there's a Westno Price article that tallow, all about tallow and how it was, can be used for nappy rash. Um, I used to use it a long time ago as a uh, body and face moisturiser. It's natural. You can add some essential oils in it if you don't, you know, to make it smell nice. You know the reason why I stopped doing that, Brenda? Why is that? I had every dog in the neighbourhood <laughs> coming up and licking me raw. That's how much they loved it. So, yeah, if you're going to use tallow, just be mindful of that. You're going to have a lot of furry friends. <laughs> Dogs love it. Okay, so now what I'm going to do, I'm just going to move the, this, these bones out of the way. Um, I'm going to start putting it into my containers. So I've got some glass jars here. I'm not a fan of putting hot things into plastic. So if you want to put it into plastic, you'll have to cool it down. Uh, otherwise, choose glass or Pyrex containers. Now, this is where we add the salt. And there's a magic formula that's written in the bone broth workshop. So for every one litre, this is a one litre jar of strained broth, you're going to add one teaspoon of salt. So adding in my teaspoon first into here of salt. And then I'm gonna get uh, my little strainer. And then I'm just gonna start, and it's best to do this if you can uh, over a sink, because it, it is a bit messy. And just straining that in. I'm bring it a bit closer. Yeah, I will. Sula, so, while you're doing that, there's another question. Yeah, um, I'm right. Would you recommend chicken or beef broth for an autoimmune disease, which is better for anti-inflammatory? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, beef broth is more gelatinous, so it's more gut healing and sealing. If you've got an autoimmune condition, one of the three preconditions to an autoimmune condition is a leaky gut. So I would be smashing the beef broth more so than the chicken. But have chicken occasionally so you don't get taste fatigue. Okay, so I've left some wiggle room here. If you're gonna freeze it, you wanna leave some wiggle room. If it's going in the fridge, not as important. You'll see also on this that there is still a little bit of tallow there. I haven't done as good a job as my staff do at broth bar, so I'm on the fly here tonight. So there's a little bit of tallow, that's fine. So when it goes into the fridge and freezer, it will solidify and you're just gonna like scoop that off and you can just stick that in a container in your freezer. I'll just show you our tallow cubes. And so we sell these at Roth Bar. I think backwards it's coming up on your screen, but they're like little fat bombs and you just melt down as much as you need in a frying pan and then stick it back in there. Now what you can do with your beef broth Instead of putting it all into containers like this, you can also freeze it into silicon ice cubes, uh, which is what we do at Broth Bar, and that's where how this was born, organic beef broth cubes. And then these can be conveniently thrown into smoothies because frozen broth is completely tasteless. Frozen food, whatever the food is, is pretty much tasteless. So it doesn't change the taste of the smoothie and you get all that beautiful gelatin, collagen, glycine goodness in your smoothie. So I started doing that uh, many years ago, or you could just use broth that's, you know, refrigerated. It doesn't need to be frozen. Um, so you can do that. 
with your beef broth. We only really make the cubes with the beef, not the chicken, okay? And the tallow, what do you do with the tallow? The tallow is what you used to cook your meat with. And you can also, you know, if you're dairy, you can melt it down and pour it over, you know, veggies when you're roasting them. So tallow is a traditional fat that your great-grandmother would have used, a very heat-stable fat to cook meat and veggies and vegetables with. Okay, so I'm not going to strain the whole of this beef broth, but you get the gist as to how I did it. And we recommend that you consume one to two cups of broth per day. You could go a little bit more if you've got digestive issues, autoimmune conditions. Um, and what else can you do with... So this is how you're going to incorporate the broth into your diet. It's all set out in here. So how to add bone broth into your diet. The first way is just drink it as a standalone hot drink. So we always have it as part of our dinner meal. As I said before, our dinner formula is meat, three veg plus broth. So we just have it as a standalone drink. Um, you can add what we call broth bombs or flavor bombs to it. In that broth bar we um, have uh, offer things like lemon juice, ginger, garlic, turmeric, um, paprika, cumin, um, you can do nori strips, you could add some miso paste in there. Asian ones are really popular, like tamari, red boat fish sauce, um, sumac, just to add a little bit more, um, you know, flavour and nutrients and take it to another level. I personally love lemon broth, uh, lem um, lemon juice in my broth. So we have that probably most nights we would have chicken broth with the lemon juice in there. So the second way you can incorporate it, as I mentioned earlier, is to freeze it into cubes and add it to your smoothies. The next way is you would use bone broth. And I should say, I should have said the outset, bone broth and stock, we use those words interchangeably. So if you're still thinking, is there a difference between bone broth and stock? 13 years ago when I started making it, we always just say stock. And then somewhere along the lines, broth is kind of a little bit more softer and friendly, but we use the words interchangeably. So the, another way to use it is in place of water in soup recipes. So all our soups are broth based. You know, why would you make a soup with water when you can use, you know, nutrient dense bone broth? Um, the next way you to incorporate stock is uh, in place of water in casseroles and stews. And I'll be showing you how to do that in just a moment. Uh, then the next uh, place you could use it is in place of water to cook rice. So if you're um, making a risotto, uh, you would soak your rice first, you'd properly prepare it, uh, rinse it, strain it, and then cook it up in your bone broth. And you can sneak it into sauces like our, you know, bolognese sauce, a broth bar, or a shepherd's pie, or any recipe that requires water, just add broth. Um, I use broth also as a base, um, added to saucepans when I'm reheating foods. So Have you got leftovers? To heat it up, if you just put the food into a saucepan, it's kind of, you know, tends to um, burn the saucepan. So add a little bit of broth in there. Uh, and then that's basically the main ways uh, that you would incorporate it. And then you've got a whole bunch of recipes for all my soups. So what we'll do now is we will, uh, I'll invite any questions. Uh, yep, and then we'll uh, move on to slow cooks. There's a few here in the chat. I'll just read them out to you. Uh, there was one... Uh, she's read, uh, Marina's read that if there's a thick layer of fat, a uh, chicken or tallow in the top of the container, it preserves the broth. Yeah, and, correct. Yeah, is that okay? She yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it acts as a preservative. Yeah. Yep. Um, and even if that's stored in the fridge for six months, is that correct? Oh, sure. I haven't done any testing on that. I think it okay. depends on how hot the broth is being poured into your jar. And if there's a special lid, like a pop lid that sucks it down, it can preserve it for up to a year. So we are next okay. week about to roll out a broth bar, our one year fridge stable broth. Okay. Um, and that's because we've, we've undergone a process where we pour into the jars, piping hot okay. to the top where there's no you know gap or air, put special lids on that are um, suction lids and then you just hear them suctioning down and then that preserves it for about a year. You can then just have to do your own experimentation in your home. The, the rule is if it smells and tastes sour, discard it. You can always freeze it, if in doubt, freeze the broth. Uh, you know, imagine there's enough wiggle room and the glass jars are thick enough. Um, so that, you know, I don't want to risk advising anybody to, to eat something six or 12 months down the track in their fridge when they haven't done proper testing. Okay. 
that kind of, there was a few around that. So I think you've answered that. Um, the other one was, do you make fish broth? And are the properties as good as chicken or beef? They're different. And that's outlined in the bone broth workshop. They are, it's not going to be gelatinous, um, but fish broth has certain micronutrients in them that the land animals don't have like iodine, which is really good for your thyroid. And a lot of us have thyroid issues in the West. So yeah, have a chicken broth, a, a fish broth every now and again. Whenever you go to a fish shop, you know, if you go once a week, uh, ask them for the whole fish and say, can you please put the frame, the head and the skeleton in one bag and the two fillets in another bag um, and go home and put the frame in some water, bring it to the boil and slow cook it for just 30 minutes. Otherwise it will go bitter. And that's about the length of time it will take you to, you know, maybe get the dinner on and, you know, pan fry the fish, pan, you know, bake the fish, put a load of washing on or whatever. And then your fish broth is done, strain it. Um, and then you can even add that fish that you've just cooked into the strained broth with some vegetables and maybe a bit of tomato puree and then you've got a beautiful Greek fish soup. I made a, a Malaysian fish broth. Yeah, fish broth. yeah mix just it up. Like just like veggies, our body likes variety. So yeah. some days beef broth, some days chicken broth, some days fish broth, you know, we, we really want variety. So while you're getting yeah, yeah. the casserole stuff ready, I just want to do a little ad break for the Western Price Foundation, which we've talked about quite a bit today and encourage you to follow up with this fantastic workshop by keeping yourself informed, becoming more informed. And the way to do that is to become a member. Western Price Foundation is actually a charity organisation with campaigns and a mission around, uh, particularly around the US, but around, uh, I think it's about 26 countries where they're doing great stuff to bring back traditional foods. And uh, every quarter, this fantastic magazine comes out with uh, FAQs, with letters to the editor, with articles that are just sensational. There's uh, tremendous information in there that will just continue your education around this. Because it takes, it takes a while, right? How long? Yeah. Mm. I mean, we're all still learning. I have hundreds of those uh, quarterly journals. They're amazing. They're just such good reads. So we'll tell you about this and the, the follow-up email that I send you tomorrow will give you the, the form, uh, but it's normally $50 US to join, which isn't even a lot. But for tonight, those people who are on the, on the call tonight or who are viewing this recording in the next couple of days, you're going to get it for $40 US. And then included in that is a free ticket to the next event, and just knowing that you're doing good things for the planet. <laughs> you need me to help you with anything? No, I'm pretty much almost ready to rock and roll. Uh, we've got another question for you, Sula. Yep. Um, someone wants to know, or Michelle wants to know, if Nutra Organics broths are suitable. If, if what broths are suitable? Nutra, N-U-T-R-A, organic. Is that a brand? I think it's a brand, yeah. Would I be recommending a competitor? <laughs> I was just about to say that. Yes, it's a brand, yeah. Yep. Um, homemade broth is the best. This is why we're doing this, if you can do it yourself. Look, with anything, I would have to read the ingredients. I would have to look at the provenance. Where are they getting their bones from? Are they pastured? Are they grass-fed? Is the water uh, uh, filtered? Are the herbs and spices organic? so on and so forth. So every time you buy something in a packet, container, tube, whatever, you have to read the ingredients and do your own due diligence. I can say that I can vouch for my own products, but I don't know about other people's. It's a dehydrated brand as well. Um, it's a dehydrated one. Well, they're yeah. very convenient. They've become very trendy. They're very convenient when you're traveling um, yeah. and you don't have access to your fresh broth. Uh, so once again, read the ingredients on them because like anything, I think they would span the spectrum. But when you're not traveling, if you can get access, you know, if you can't make it yourself by uh, learning how to make it with our bone broth workshop, then you can always buy it from Broth Bar. We have an online store as well, depending on where you're located, of course. Okay, so question. shall we move on to casseroles? Yep. One more question. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. With reverse osmosis, does yeah. it take all the minerals out too? It does, and that's why they now add 
an alkalizer, which adds back minerals lost through filtration. Uh, but we always recommend to add a pinch of salt to your water. So if you've done a health coaching session with me or food is medicine talk, you know I'm really uh, adamant about adding unrefined salt to your water. And of course, we season our food with salt because our bodies are just so demineralized. Okay. All right, shall we move on to um, slow cook? So one of the things that you can do with your bone broth is add it to a slow cooked meal. Now, once again, everything I say about slow cooks is in my online slow cook workshop called Casserole Pot Roast and Roast, and you'll be getting a discount to that tonight. So in here, once again, lifetime access, you get all the nutritional theory, all of my Casserole Pot Roast and Roast uh, recipes, and I explain the difference between the three. Tonight, we're just looking basically at casseroles. So casserole stew, use those words interchangeably, basically involves cooking meat, preferably on the bone because all the nutrients in the bone will come out during the slow cooking process. Uh, typically with some vegetables, although you can omit them, in some sort of liquid and you're gonna cover the pot and stick it in the oven or slow cooker uh, for a long period of time at low temperatures. So that's pretty much what a casserole is. Now, after pouring over hundreds of casserole recipes for more than a decade, including my own original recipes, I started to seek out and find a common thread among the recipes, essentially a formula. That's my brain works in terms of formulas that can be used and applied to all the recipes to simplify them and to make them more um, replicatable when creating new flavors. Then I deduced that all casserole recipes basically have this four pronged or four categories of ingredients, which is meat, vegetables, herbs and spices, and then some liquid. And that's why my casserole recipes are in fact set out in a table. It's like a tabula recipe. This is what we do at Broth Bar and Lard and my recipes are in tables. So that all you need to do is once you've found the flavor that you want to do, say Indian, you then choose your cut of meat, you then add in the herbs and spices, you add in the liquid and you add in your desired vegetables. And hopefully what this table will do is it will facilitate or inspire you to create your own casseroles in your own home using your own you know, cuts of meat and flavors and whatever you wanna do. So you can basically essentially mix and match. So it's a bit like creating your own casserole adventure, okay? So draw inspiration from the table and create potentially unlimited casseroles in your own home. So if we look at each of those four ingredients, um, the first one is meat. So today we're going to make um, an osso buco. Now osso buco is the name of the overall dish and also the cut of meat. Okay, it's an Italian dish and the name osso buco basically means hole in the bone because you can see the beautiful bone marrow, there's a hole there with bone marrow in it and that's where all the glamour is, okay? Once again, the same principles apply as with your bones provenance, really important. So grass fed and finished. So you walk into any old butcher and say, um, I'd like some grass fed and finished or 100% grass fed meat. So uh, we can put the meat straight in. Doesn't really matter what order you're putting them in. Okay, and the one, what I love about casseroles, which you'll see, is the convenience of them. We're just gonna be adding all these ingredients into our cast iron dish you can use a slow cooker if you like i'm a traditional cook so i prefer cast iron pots i just love the the flavor and the you know the, the heaviness of them and everything about them just the experience of them um, you have to be kind of comfortable leaving them in your oven or on your stovetop overnight and some people feel more comfortable with a slow cooker whatever floats your boat that's fine just be aware when you're dealing with slow cookers you can just have it on low um, and make sure that the insert is lead free. And I know the ones that they sell at Harvey Norman are lead free, but you have to do some due diligence there. Okay, so you've got your meat, preferably on the bone. The next uh, ingredient are... With a bit of fat, yeah. right? You yeah, want, yeah, so, want... so the, the, the fat, the organs, the bone marrow, you know, that's, you know, the bones, that's where all the glamour is, you know? So our hunter-gatherer ancestors, the traditional societies really prized 
the fat, the bones and the organs of the animals because they knew from trial and error over millennia, they're the most nutrient dense part of the animal. It's where all the glamour is. Muscle meat was often discarded, you know. So we want to make sure that we, we're bringing these odd bits back to the modern table. Okay, same question that arose with the bones. You don't need to brown the meat unless you're doing a really short casserole. My casseroles are for like eight plus hours. It's going to be flavoursome enough over eight hours. You, it doesn't warrant that extra step of browning the bones. My mum would you know, never have dreamed of cooking anything for more than two hours in her oven, so she was browning everything to add the flavour. Okay, so we've got our meat in there. Um, next, we can add in some you know, herbs and spices. So once again, just grab a teaspoon, here we go. Uh, what we're doing with the Osso Buco is Mediterranean. So I'm gonna add in one to two teaspoons of some basil leaf, one teaspoon of paprika. Obviously all the recipes and the proportions are in the table. Uh, one to two um, teaspoons of thyme, oregano, uh, and you know, some bay leaves. Okay, so herbs and spices, provenance is important there as well. Conventional ones will be sprayed. So once you use them up, just then buy organic so that they're not sprayed. Um, then we've got some vegetables. Okay, so for the Osso Buco, I've got things like carrot. Now, um, if they're organic, you don't need to, you don't need to peel them. There's gorgeous soil microbes here, which is so important uh, for our overall health. So unless they're looking like really soil packed um, or if they're not organic, um, I would wash them and peel them because they're organic. Uh, I'm just chopping these up. I've got some celery here. Finishing off these other carrot. Uh, a hot tip is I work with what I call a bench tidy. So all my veggie scraps go straight into there uh, in order to um, not break your flow. You don't want to be running back and forward to the bin. Um, you can throw in the celery leaves as well. I've just got here some celery stalks. Add those in. Now I've timed myself doing this on numerous hundreds of cooking classes. And I always do this in single digit minutes. Yes, you heard that correct. Single digit minutes. So if you wanna make a meal in literally a matter of minutes and then bang it in the oven for eight plus hours, you know, eight to 24 hours, but it just works its magic uh, overnight of its own volition, then casseroles are just the simplest, easiest thing. They're just incredibly convenient and they're great for dinner parties because you can mean that you can spend the entire day out of the house um, put the casserole in first thing in the morning, uh, spend the day out of the house, and then, you know, half an hour before the guests arrive, just make a few salads, and you're done. It's like, and then you just wow the socks off everyone. The meat's so tender, it's falling off the bone. Everyone's salivating and saying, oh, my God, this must have taken you hours, and you're sitting there sheepishly embarrassed because of how simple you know, I remember as a vegetarian, I'd be in the kitchen all day chopping veggies, you know, soaking the grains and the legumes, combining them to make it. Oh, God, it was just such hard work. The dinner party, you know, would be over and I'd collapse into a heap exhausted. Um, so life's very convenient, quick, easy and different uh, when you use traditional whole foods. So some onions, uh, slicing these up. So... In my workshop booklet, I set out, you know, my six things I absolutely love about bone broth. And as I mentioned, one is convenience. Uh, because something that takes, what people don't understand is they think that if something is slow cooked for, you know, 10, 12, 8 hours, they think that that means 10, 12, 8 hours of effort. And it doesn't. It means literally a few minutes of effort to reap the rewards of you know, 8, 10, 12 hours of deliciousness. The next thing I love about casseroles is the nutrition. So pastured meat, vegetables, you know, herbs and spices. These are some of the most, you know, organic. Uh, these are some of the most nutritious food on the planet. And when they're all combined in the one pot, you can be assured that your family's really getting a beautifully delicious and nourishing meal. Um, Flavour, they're really flavoursome because nutrients, did you know, is precisely what gives food its flavour. So the more nutrient dense something is, the more flavoursome it's going to be. The next thing, I've added some potatoes and now I'm adding in some uh, sweet potato. You know, we, I don't even peel my potatoes and sweet potatoes. 
Um, you won't really notice a difference with the end product. It's up to you what you choose to do. With, as I said before, with organic, I don't bother. Um, the next thing I really love about casseroles is their digestibility. The long, slow cooking process really tugs apart all of the connective tissue and the meat becomes so tender it falls off the bone. So if you've got a, you know, quite a fragile digestive system and you can't really handle um, the notion or the ability to eat a chunk of meat, a steak, then opt for a slow cook casserole because it's just going to be really tender and it will fall off the bone. Some um, cuts of meat like osso can only be cooked through long slow cooking. You can't pan fry an osso like a steak. It's got to be done through long slow cooking. And the last thing I love about them is just their you know, ability to freeze and reheat. Just make a big batch, get a real life. People say, you know what, how big are Le Creuset or Le Chasseau should I get? The biggest one you can afford, make a huge amount. And just like bone broth, you're not gonna you know, make small amounts. Daddy can make a big amount and then just freeze. Okay, so we've added in our meat, our herbs and spices, our veggies. The last thing is some liquid. So one cup of uh, bone broth we'll be adding. Fancy that. I've got some bone broth just here mm. that we've just made. So one cup of that will go in. Um, I'm adding in one cup of tomato puree. Okay, in the glass jars, not the tins. We don't want any BPAs. Oh, of course, you can find some BPA for the tins. This is just single ingredient tomato puree without any preservatives. And then a quarter of a cup of, I've got here some preservative free organic red wine. Uh, you don't have to add the red wine. It, all the alcohol boils off. So don't worry that, you know, you're not, that, you know, you might be, uh, you know, get your children. Getting, getting your kids you're, you're drunk. Getting your kids drunk. You don't have to worry about that. Um, you can omit the alcohol though if you want to and just, Put in either a minute or substitute balsamic vinegar. Okay, and then that's it. So literally that didn't take me very long at all. You can literally do it within a matter of minutes. Bang the lid on, stick it in the oven, and there's a uh, once again a little table in my online workshop that sets out different temperatures uh, for different lengths of cooking time. Uh, different degrees for different lengths of cooking time. So 80 degrees for eight plus hours is my general rule. You can go shorter uh, hours, but you're going to have to turn the temperature up. And we work within a band of 80 to 120 degrees. I don't really like cooking higher than 120 degrees uh, because it creates inflammation in the body. So we're proponents of long, slow cooking. Um, if you wanted to, you could put this in the fridge. If your dinner party wasn't until, I don't know, maybe... 36 hours away, you can put it in the fridge for 24 hours or whatever and, you know, and then put it in that oven so that will just marinate it. Uh, so then that's pretty much ready to go in the oven. And then I will pull one out that I made uh, from this morning. So that's been slow cooking from 9am this morning, so about 11 hours. So I'll just create a little bit of space for that here. Did you add any seasoning? Oh, I need to add salt and pepper. Good point. Forgot that. Thanks, there'd, be a, there'd be a little bit more broth. Over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, definitely one teaspoon of salt and a few good turns of pepper. And the salt over here, that's why I omitted it. Uh, accidentally good. So unsalted food to me is so tasteless. Okay, so that's done. We've got the four pronged formula happy. Okay, and then we're just going to pull one out that I made earlier today. Now, you'll notice with the veggies, before I open this, I just want to tell you some important information. Um, I didn't add any above ground veggies. That's really important. Our diet is balanced with both below ground and above ground veggies. I don't add above ground veggies to casseroles because they tend to just disintegrate over you know, eight plus hours. So what I do is I add them into the last hour or half an hour of cooking or just serve them separately, okay? So then I'll open this up and there you can see you've got a beautiful osso buco there. And if you, you know, turn it over, um, you've got your beautiful vegetables. You've got the lovely bone marrow that's in there. So lucky person going to get that you know your broth that's in there so you don't need to have broth separately because you've got it in here i tend to serve these in soup bowls 
and all your herbs and spices. If you wanted to, what we do at Broth Bar is we chop up some, you know, some spinach or leafy greens, lots of parsley, and just stir that through before serving it. Now, I've done this with an osso buco, uh, and I followed the Mediterranean recipe in the table. I could have used a lamb shoulder. I could have used lamb shanks. I could have used um, oxtail. I could have used beef cheeks. I could have used uh, beef chuck steak. So you've got all these options that you can then choose from. Uh, and then that's, that's it. There's lots of tips and tricks in here as well. And then, of course, I just talk about pot roast and, and roast, which we won't go into. So... It smells fantastic. I know. We're going to enjoy this. <laughs> Still like out, there's a question. Yeah, of course, What's, fire away with questions. <laughs> what salt do you use? Yeah, any unrefined salt, so Himalayan uh, salt or Celtic sea salt or Murray River Lake salt, like the Aussie ones and us always to support Aussie manufacturer, Aussie brands. Any other questions? I'm sure Sandra's got a few more. Yeah. Um, I'm just checking, I think. With the girls have answered most of the other ones as we've gone along in the chat. That was the only last one hanging out there. Okay. Unless anyone else has got any and wants to pop them in. Would anyone chat? there like to unmute themselves? Any Here's questions? another question. <laughs> uh, at what point was the salt added to the broth? At the end when you're straining it and putting it into the containers. That answer that question, Elise. <laughs> because then you get the perfect ratio of one litre to one teaspoon or half a litre to half a teaspoon. Yeah. Cool. Uh, how many slow cooks would you eat each week? Oh, it really varies, but I, pop, I don't know if I would even eat one a week. Um, in... I'm not really rigid in terms of meal planning. I'm kind of go with the flow and then make sure that I always just eat real food. But, you know, may, maybe one a week, one, one a fortnight. I just kind of really go with the flow. I, I love my steak as well. Like, and I do a pot, a pot roast is quite different to a casserole. It's more like a Greek barbecue flavour where there's no liquid. It's just, and it's so much quicker than this. If this takes five minutes, pot roast takes two minutes to make. It's just like a chunk of meat that you rub it with the spices, put the lid on and forget about it in the oven. And it, when you open it up eight hours later or 24 hours later, it's like a Greek barbecue. It's crispy on the outside and tender on the inside. So they're nicer in summer because I serve them with a salad. Casseroles I, I like more in winter because it's more soupy. And a roast, you know, do a roast chicken or a roast pork, we would do probably once a month. Other questions or even some comments? How people <laughs> so, uh, Kate wants to know when you're moving into her house, can you cook for her? <laughs> well, maybe she can move in here and do all my <laughs> Jenny's asked, um, she presumes you can freeze the food after you've cooked it. Absolutely, 100%. 100%. Uh, another question, how do the pot roasts not dry out? Because when the lid is on, it creates moisture like a mini oven. And when you take the lid off, you will be amazed at all the liquid that will naturally come out. You're like, I didn't add this liquid in there. How did that liquid get there? It's like about a cup of liquid. It's just come out. Um, whereas if the lid was off, then we call that a roast and that's a much shorter cooking time. Otherwise it will dry out. If the lid is off for eight hours, it will be kind of burnt. So that, and I talk about the difference between the three in the workshop. Um, it says, when are the classes? Uh, Michelle wants to know when the classes are. And then um, yep. Brenda, you could probably answer this one. How do you join up? to what's Western A price. So my bone broth, slow cook workshop, and a, and a few others like organ meats, which we all should be eating, baked cakes, gluten-free baked cakes, and healthy chocolate, they are all on my website. We'll flick to a slide in a second that shows. They're all pre-recorded and online, so I don't run any of those in person anymore. I've been running workshop every week for 10 years. Um, I've got a videographer to come in, recorded me. So they are now online. You can download them. They're normally $79 each, but you can buy two of them as bundles. So it's a bundled up some of them. So bone broth and slow cook are bundled up for $125. But 
for tonight's viewers, you get it at $99. So we'll just maybe flick to, I will can screen share if you uh, like, and I'll just show you how you can find it on my website. We'll also send you an email um, with it in as well. So keep going. Yep. So if you purchase the bone broth in this local bundle, it's 99 for you guys instead of 125. If you add in WAPF, West Enterprise Price Foundation, in the discount code at the checkout. So I know that's a really long URL, but if you go to my website, you know, um, they'll get that tomorrow. You'll get that tomorrow, yeah. But if you're really eager and want to do it tonight, if you go onto my website and go online workshops, it's bundle two, basically. And if you type in that discount code, that code only lasts until Monday night. I think that's Sunday. Off oh, Sunday, Sunday night, night. yeah, the yeah. 9th. Uh, so make sure you buy it between now, Wednesday night and Sunday night uh, to get it at $99. As I said, they're normally $79 each or $125 to do. So it's really good value and you have lifetime access to it. And you also, while you're there, if you want to get the chocolate one, healthy chocolate uh, and organ meats and baked cakes, feel free. And then for the Western A Price Foundation membership, which is normally 50 but will be 40 also for about that time till the end of the weekend. All we want to do is actually complete a form and everyone who's registered for this event will get an email from me sometime tomorrow, maybe Friday, <laughs> um, with all the links and all the, the, the details of Sula and I'll have this attached as a, a, mm. an attachment and everything else I can think of. Western yeah. A Christ Foundation has a Facebook page for Sydney, Sydney chapter, and Sally, who is another chapter member, chapter leader, she's uh, here on this call as well today. Uh, and then membership in yes, you get the magazine every quarter, which is really yes. valuable. You also get access to the members only. Facebook group and that's a brilliant resource. There's about 15,000 people on that and you can go in and just ask whatever question like my daughter's having this, you know, she's having a baby, what should she do or whatever. Um, and also there's a ton of information already there that you can search. So that's a really great, really yeah, great connection. It's such a great foundation, great organisation. Mm. Like I'm not a member of many, if any, organisations, but this is one I am. Mm. And I'm really proud to be a part of the foundation because the work they do is so important mm. in educating the public on the importance of ancestral diets. Um, and, I, you know, I feel West Nate Price Foundation, well, West Nate Price philosophy really changed my life mm. and my baby's life. So I just feel, you know, very honoured and grateful for a start to be presenting and working with, with you on this, but I can't recommend them highly enough. Yeah. Yeah, and we're really committed to getting the information out there. And tonight was just the 10th foundational principle, which was the bro the bone broth. Um, but there's nine others. Mm. And we encourage you to find out about those as well. Yeah. One at a time, introduce yeah. things slowly. Like, like I am, I, I'm doing these talks with people like Sula just so I can um, learn it and learn it from people like you who've been mm. doing it way longer and I encourage you to be part of our little group here to keep yourself inspired uh, in the kitchen. And if you do want to know more, I also run full day comprehensive food as medicine talks with a holistic dietitian and GAPS practitioner and functional medicine practitioner uh, who's as passionate about Western Air Price and ancestral diets and regenerative farming as I am. So if you like this little teaser and you want to immerse yourself in a full day of understanding Western Air Price Foundational principles, and I know a lot of you on the, the call tonight did my food as medicine talk on the weekend. I'm only running three this year. I've been touring Australia for the past two years. So my last and next one is on the 24th of October. It's on my website. If you go to workshops, you know, live or in-person workshops, we're doing it as a Zoom webinar again because we're just getting people from all around the world joining. So if you want to put all the nutritional jigsaw puzzle pieces together, you'll also get access to all five of my online workshops absolutely for free as part of that full day 
course. Yeah. Um, yeah, so have a look at that. So we're here to support and help you in your, in your wellness journey. So we've come to the end and we promised 8.30 oh. would be <laughs> perfect. Bang on the door. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. We really appreciate you being here. And you're welcome to uh, just stay on a little bit longer if anyone would like to. If you've got any further questions, I'm not. And yeah, yeah have we're, a, we're not in any rush. So if you want to unmute, ask away. Uh, yeah, I'd yeah. love to also hear some feedback on how everybody enjoyed tonight. Yes, we'll have a survey for you tomorrow as well. So we've already written that survey. We'll give you um, a chance to help us get better at this and to, to let us know what inspired you as well yeah so, and it, i'm certainly inspired i love also buka i'd love to know more about what marrow does yeah bone marrow's got special um immune boosting fats called akgs that boost the immune system because of course um, bone marrow is where all our um, white, white blood, blood cells, cells, cells are, are made yeah right. so it's so important that yeah. we and i remember my dad used to suck the marrow from the bone yeah, I mean, how many yeah. families in australia would do that now right. so we want to just bring right. that back to the table these beautiful ancestral practices um, and and if, if you're not sure, I didn't explain. Also, book goes from the um, hind leg, hind shank of a, a cow or lamb. So it's a big, thick muscle. Yeah, right. If you look at your thigh, so the only way really to get that tender is to slow cook it. And it breaks down the, the collagen mm. and fats as you cook slow it cook it. Yeah. Exactly. Although all the connective tissue are broken down. Mm. Yeah, so we're going to enjoy that. Mm. Well, I remember having. Crumbed lamb's brains. Oh, yes. Very popular. Growing. Yep. Yeah, but I don't know if I like them all that much. Uh, I remember tongue. We had an ox tongue. Yeah, that's in I my... I actually really um, like that. In my organ meat workshop, you'll find recipes oh. for the tongue. What else did we have? Yeah, so kidneys. when I... Yeah, they can kidneys. Right. They can kidneys. Yeah. Kidneys quite an acquired flavour. It's very is, strong. Yeah. Texture is But one of our, our three most popular meals at Rothbar are the sneaky meals where we sneak in lamb's... Um, sorry, chicken livers. So sneaky shepherd's pie, sneaky bolognese, uh, and sneaky bunless burgers. So there are three most popular meals of broth are the sneaky meals. Yeah. Anna, did you want to say something? You're off mute, so I'm assuming you'd like to ask a question. Yeah. Anna, maybe it was accidental. Maybe. I was going to say there's liver as well. I grew up oh, liver. liver, yeah. Oh, pate. Mm. Oh, my gosh. Or well, even just. What is it, liverwurst or something like that? Liverwurst. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure how. I'm not sure what's in that though. Mm, to look at the ingredients. Yeah. But live, do you make liver with bacon and our liver broth bar is um, the key to a great pate is lots of onions and lots of butter. Butter. Yeah, I've got to have butter in it. Yeah. We Sally, also do a dairy free one for those who can't have dairy. Sally says, Sally Fallon says that the, the liver and the butter combination is a mm. really perfect balance exactly. yeah because liver contains the, the fat soluble vitamins a d e and k2 when you combine it with the fat so that those vitamins and minerals can be assimilated in the body yeah right so yeah that is so important that is so important and just melts the fat off you as well so if you're overweight I'll have the to more try of that fat, yeah like melt a little bit of a <laughs> little bit of fat off you you end up becoming lean um yeah anything else before we close just sandra is there anything else typed in oh wow well, i think i think we are pretty good as i just flick through yep most questions have been answered it was just about the memberships the links have been put up uh, so, oh, there was a question, Marina had one. Um,